this morning we're going to look at a passage of scripture in uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and, and we're going to be reminded in the words of, of Paul something that I hope we're reminded of here on numerous occasions, and that is that the primary incubator for faith is not the church, it's the home, it's family. That's the primary incubator for the development of the faith. And as I have said on other occasions, the church is here to supplement that, to encourage that, to equip that, to enable that. But the home, biblically speaking, has always been the epicenter of Christian life and Christian development. I'm afraid we, we've stepped away from that and, and thought the church is to be that role. But it is not. The, the family has always been the primary place to incubate and nurture and grow and sustain the faith. And you're going to see that come through in, in what Paul writes about. I realize that today is obviously Mother's Day, but I want all of us to think about as we as we hear what Paul has to say, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're married or not, the primary relationships we have in our lives are of critical importance. Now, most of those primary relationships are within the context of family. The relationship we have with our spouse, the relationship we have with our children, the relationship we have with, with our parents. But we are formed by the relationships we have. Just a it's just the truth. You and I are formed, we're shaped by the relationships we have, and the reverse is true. We have the greatest impact in shaping and forming another in and through those primary relationships. Relationships are critically important. Some months ago I did a sermon series as uh, we looked at the, the life and ministry of Jesus in the context of relationships. The number one priority for Jesus was relationships. Ultimately, the relationship with the Heavenly Father. But primary to his ministry was relationships, relating to people, pouring himself into people, into his disciples, into those that came and listened and followed, and those that he healed, those that he touched, was relationships. And so I don't want us to think as we sit here this morning that this is just only for moms. It is, this is for all of us and it's applicable to all of those primary relationships that we have. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of, of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This Paul says is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, and it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, break them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. If you were to look at the totality of Ephesians chapter 5, you would see that again, it's talking about those primary relationships. He just narrows right here for just a moment upon, upon family and upon family relationships and the critical importance that family plays as again, being the primary spiritual incubator uh, for nurturing and growing the Christian faith. Well, I want to talk about today, as we think about relationships, three relationship builders. Three things that are critically important 
to these primary relationships that, that we have, to nurture them, to grow them, to enrich them, to be enriched by them. They're simple, easy things, but I'm going to tell you, and I think as we kind of go through these, we'll kind of admit we don't always get these right. We don't always get these right. So on a Sunday when we're kind of focused on family and, and, uh, and, and those relationships, three relationship <coughs> this morning that come or are implied by what Paul has written here in Ephesians 5 and then elsewhere in Scripture. So, relationship builder number one, say it. Say it. Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Why don't you to think about that for just a moment. I mean, words have power. Words have impact. Words can shape people. Words can either build people up or tear people down. They have, again, according to Scripture, the power of life or death. And in these primary relationships, we need to understand we have an awesome opportunity and capacity to speak life to one another. And you and I, in family, at home, in these primary relationships, need to be speaking words of admiration, affection and affirmation. We need to be speaking life to each other. We need to say to each other what we need to say to each other. I say that because, and this probably sadly won't surprise you, but in 30 years of ministry, I've had many adult children who have said to me in one context or another, you know what, I never heard my mom or dad ever say to me, I love you. In fact, sometimes, if we're not careful, what we say is anything but life. Reminded of the I've got to be lighthearted here for just a moment. It's a little heavy. Reminded of the, the son who, whose mom was just hypercritical, hypercritical. And uh, anyway, he had graduated college, was in his professional career, and she was back here in Virginia. He had been living out in California. And, and anyway, he had kind of established this relationship with a, a young lady and was planning on asking her to marry him. And, and he was thinking about there's going to come that moment when I've got to introduce her to mom. And you know, mom's just negative. Mom's just negative. And so he was all worried about that. And so she was coming out to California for a visit. He thought, well, maybe this will be an opportunity to kind of make the introduction. But knowing her kind of affect, he decided that he would, he would try to cushion the announcement a little bit. And so he invited his soon-to-be fiance and three other women that he knew really well, so four ladies over for dinner. So mom arrives and the next evening, you know, these four ladies come over to his apartment for dinner and they had dinner with me and mom and the dinner goes well and the food is nice and then they then they all leave and, and mom says to her son, she goes, well that that was a pretty good meal. So he sits mom down in the living room and he says, well, I have, I have some news I want to, want to share with you. He, he said, one of those four women I'm planning on asking to marry me in the very near future. And she went, oh. And he said, I'm going to see if you could guess which one of the four it is. <laughs> and so she said, oh, it's the blonde with the short hair. And he said, wow, how did you know? And she said, because she was the only one I didn't like all through now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to speak life to each other. We need to say it. I want to give you a little power word, and I heard this years ago at a conference I was attending, and there was a professional counselor that was uh, that was leading a breakout session. And, and uh, anyway, she said that this is kind of a power word. And you know, 
you and I say, I love you. We might look at our kids and say, I'm proud of you. Uh, we might look at, at a coworker and say, hey, I appreciate you. And, and you know, when, that, that's a good thing to do, but, but we can take all of those statements to another level if we add a power word at the end of that phrase. If we were to add the word because. I want you to think about this for just a moment. We were to add the word because. So when you look at your spouse and say, I love you, say, I love you because, and then fill that in. When you look at your son or daughter, say, I love you or I'm proud of you because, and then fill that in. When you look at a really good friend or a coworker that you really value and you say to them, I appreciate you, say, because, and then fill that in. That's going to take that statement to a much more meaningful and satisfying and fulfilling level because it shows that you have put intentional thought into why you have expressed that particular statement or feeling to them. And you know, that's biblical. When you look at the Psalms, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, look at the Psalms. There's there's one big category of psalms. There are all kinds of different psalms, but the main category of psalms are what are called praise psalms. They're, they're just psalms that, that folks have written that are praises to God. Praises to God. And when you read a praise psalm, there is always a litany of statements written by the psalmist as to why they are praising God. And so I want to suggest to you this morning that in thinking about your ultimate primary relationship, your relationship with, with the Heavenly Father, use the word because there. So when you go to pray to God, say, God, I love you because. And then fill that in. God, I worship you today because. And then fill that in. And it's going to take that thought process and that statement to a new level. To a new level. But that's just maybe a practical way that, that we can think about, you know, saying to folks what we need to say. And not being cliche and not just being mundane and not being routine and not saying it just kind of flippantly as we leave the house, but saying it with intentionality. Life. Life. I heard a pastor telling a story not, not too long ago. Then he got called to the hospital, and it was an older couple that had been in his church for many, many years, and the wife had had a significant heart in that. He gets to the, to the hospital, and the wife is there in the room in the hospital bed, and she is unconscious. And she's hooked up to the various machines and a respirator, and the husband is there. They've been married for over 50 years. And so his ministry, obviously, in that moment is, is to the husband because the wife is completely unresponsive. And so he's talking with the husband. And the husband looks at the, looks at the pastor and says to him, as he kind of looks at his, at his wife and his dad, he said, you know, we were married for over 50 years and I never said to her, I love you. So before he left the room, they have, a, they have a prayer together. And as a part of that prayer, one of, the pre one of the requests that was made in that prayer is that the wife might have a moment of lucidity, might be conscious just for, a, just for a little while, so that this husband, who had not spoken it for over 50 years, would have an opportunity to say, what he so desperately wanted to say to his wife, and what he had not. It didn't happen. It would be a wonderful story, wouldn't it, if, if it did happen, and, and if we had a very touching moment, it didn't happen. The wife lingered for about another day or two, and then went to be with the Lord. Caskets don't hear. Cadavers don't hear. pastor in sharing this story said that at the funeral the husband just openly wept throughout the whole service whispering the words, looking at the casket, I love you I love you say it say it 
words, the power of the tongue can speak one That's a relationship builder. Say it. Say it. Second relationship builder, I told you this was going to be easy, but sometimes we don't always get them right. Do it. And let me just say something quickly about it. Say, if, if we don't speak it, it just leaves people to assume it, and they may assume incorrectly. Do it. Do it. We have to act in concert with what it is that we express. Do it. I want to give you just a, a couple little, little thoughts. Purposeful time. We need to prioritize our relationships on our calendar. We need to prioritize those relationships on, on our calendar. Craig Rochelle, who I've uh, talked about in here a little, uh, on, on other occasions, we call him today a mega church pastor, uh, has a large congregation, has various satellite campuses around the United States. He's a uh, well-published uh, author and, and whatnot. He was speaking uh, one time to a pastor's conference, and he does not do that often to his credit. He is not out of town flying all across the country leading conferences to his credit. And I'm going to tell you why here in just a moment. We'll figure it out pretty quickly. He's speaking to a pastor's conference about his church and uh, the strategies that they've used over the years to do various ministries and the way that those ministries have been responded to. And he's kind of done some cutting edge things in terms of church planning and church growth. And so that's kind of the focus of his of his talk, and there was a little Q and A at the end of his uh, at the end of his of his presentation, and, and a hand went up. He called on that on that pastor, and the pastor asked the question. He said, "If you, in thinking about your ministry, mega church, books, you're married, you got six children, you and your wife, all of them school aged at that time, and man, you just got a lot going on. If you could, if you could encapsulate in one word." the secret of your pastoral and personal success, what would that one word be? And Craig Rochelle said, I felt like this guy was fishing for the typical usual stuff, vision, mission, goals, purpose. All of those are good words. I'm wrong with any of those. He said, I, my answer was, the one word that has led to my success is, and this is another power word, just like the code. No. No. He said, when I say no to everybody that wants me to come out of town and speak at a conference or go to a convention or or uh, go do a, you know, a book launch or a book signing. Whenever I say no, I'm saying no to some good things so that I can say yes to the most important things. Most important things, wife, kids, church. That's why he only does four conferences a year. You and I need to use the power word no so that we can say yes the best things. No one at home should ever feel like they're competing with someone at work. Not your kids, not your spouse. No one at home should ever feel like they're competing with someone at work. Your primary relationship should not suffer because you have said yes to good things and have left the best things untended. You with me? Craig Rochelle was right. There's a, there's a power in the word no that then allows us the opportunity to say a big yes to the most important things in our life, those primary relationships that we have. Always remember this. What you need to do should never be second to what another will do. If you're married, your wife 
has only one husband. A husband has only one wife. That's unique to you. I told the morning service that uh, I am Candy's husband. As far as I know, she has no other husband. <laughs> so that's unique to me. If you're a mom or a dad or a stepmom or a stepdad, your role is unique to you. Never trade that or make that secondary for what roles you do have that others can and will do. And so we have to act upon, we have to do it, not just say it. Make sense? And I think that's in many ways what Paul is driving at here in Ephesians chapter 5. It's about doing, and this is going to lead me to my third point, it's about doing in the home, in those primary relationships, what is needed and necessary and what is primary. Last one is be it. Be it. Ephesians chapter 5, if you want the love of Christ in your home, be the love of Christ in your home. If you want the love of Christ in your marriage, be the love of Christ in your marriage. If you want the love of Christ to dwell richly in your sons and daughters, be the love of Christ to them as a mom or a dad. Be it. Be it. And that's why I think Paul is so, uh, driving home so much, about the love of Christ being in the persons that in Ephesians 4 were there in that home. You be the love of Christ if you want the love of Christ to be a part of those primary relationships. And that's why he says, you know, you love as Christ loved. <clears throat> you love as Christ loved. You're being the love of Christ. When you and I are being it, that bridges the gap between intentions and action. You know, you and I can hope and intend to be all kinds of things, but if we don't actually act upon it and become it, it just left as a good intention. I think this is powerfully demonstrated in a passage of, of Scripture in uh, John chapter 13. Jesus had been talking about servanthood, he had been ministering, he had been telling parables, he had been preaching, and his disciples had seen that, heard that, and had been with Jesus days, weeks, years, a couple years. But there comes a moment in John chapter 13 where Jesus gets up from the table, he's there with his disciples at, at a meal, he gets up from that table, and he takes a wash basin, and he wraps a towel around his waist, and he goes and really without speaking a word beforehand, he goes and he starts washing the disciples' feet. And so he washes the feet of those disciples. And then, in John 13, we, we, have, we have this recorded for us. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place, his place at the table. And he asked them, he says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. He was those things, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. The power of that act is Jesus acting and demonstrating the principle that if he wanted them to really know what it was to be a servant, then he demonstrates in that room, at that meal, at that table, the lowest of servanthood possible. So for them to truly understand what servanthood was all about, he became the lowest servant possible.
hostile in that room, in that moment, and says to them, do you know what I just done? If you want the love of Christ in your marriage, in your home, in your primary relationships, be the love of Christ. Be it. Three quick relationship builders. Say it. Do it. Most importantly, be it. Father God, we are grateful again for relationships. For the opportunity to be a part of, of a Christian home, as Christian parents. And Lord, maybe, maybe we didn't grow up in one, but we have the opportunity as believers today to be the love of Christ, to be the presence of Christ in the lives of our kids. We have the opportunity to be the love of Christ in our marriages. We have the opportunity to be the presence of the love of Christ to that co-worker, to that friend, to the one in whom we have an influence. And so Lord, help us today to take the words stated and implied by the Apostle Paul and elsewhere in Scripture to speak life into our families, into our homes, into our relationships. Lord, may we prioritize on our calendars those folks, our kids, our spouses. Lord, may they never feel like they're secondary. May they never feel like they're competing with folks at work for our attention and our time and our best energies. And Lord, most of all, may we not only say it, do it, but may we be it. Be the love of Christ. And those closest to us, may we love as you have loved us. And how awesome and powerful that is. In Jesus' name we pray and give all the glory.